فالحق ما هو الحمد لله وكفى الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم مخاتم النبي محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم Brother Chairman Dr. Mustafa Umar who is my dear brother uh, Professor Hassanuddin uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Professor Ahmed Kamil Mira who is long has a long historical relationship with this university and also their brother of mine brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh our topic today is uh, it is perhaps permissible to describe it as an exciting topic topic an islamic eschatological explanation of modern western civilization eschatology is that branch of knowledge which studies the end of history uh, religion says that history History will not end normally. Western civilization says there is no end of history. We are the end of history. But religion says that there is going to be an end of history. And history is going to end with a special age of tests and trials. It, rather, it matters not whether you are Hindu or a Jew, or a Christian, or a Muslim, we all have the same view. Uh, our Prophet, as blessings be upon him, has spoken more than any other human being on this subject. And uh, in the Quran as well, there is an enormous amount of information on eschatology. And uh, it's about time <laughs> that we started to study it because we are living in the end time. When you see these strange events occurring, for example, that women would dress like men, you know, with the jacket and tie. And men would dress like women, you know, abandoning your functional role as men in society. But women would be dressed and yet naked and therefore provoking a sexual revolution. All of these are signs of the last day. But perhaps the most momentous of all, the sign of all signs of the last day, is the return of the son of Mary, Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And so our sources for our subject of an Islamic eschatological explanation of modern Western civilization cannot be a thesis written by someone at UIA. It cannot be CNN. <laughs> It cannot be a Jazeera. Our sources will have to be the book of Allah and the messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And there is a methodology with which we must study the book of Allah if we are to derive what the book of Allah says on this subject. 
there are two kinds of verses in the Quran. You don't have to be reminded of that. And it is by the divine wisdom that there are these two kinds of verses. The first which is not a test for you, because it's there in front of you, you just have to read it. Ayat Muhkaman. The verses which are plain and clear, there is no test. No. You just have to read it, just explain it, tafsir. And this is Ummul Kitab. And so what defines a Muslim must be located here. What makes you a Muslim must be located here, not elsewhere. And then in addition to this, there are other verses which are there to test you. That's why they are there. Ayat mutashabihat are verses which have to be interpreted. So eat and drink until the white thread of dawn is distinct from the black thread. You all used to fly as a kite when you were a teenager. So you know about flying a kite? Shake your head if you fly a kite. Yeah? So you know the thread, the twine. So eat and drink until the white thread of dawn is distinct from the black thread. But I am reliably informed that in Malaysia they don't put a white thread and black thread underneath the pillow when they sleep in Ramadan. I don't know why Malaysia doesn't do it. They don't put a white thread and a black thread underneath the pillow when they sleep in Ramadan. So in the morning when you wake up and you eat your morning meal, you'd use the white thread and black thread to determine when to begin the fast. Why are you laughing? Well, what the Quran says. So one companion, he had some difficulty. He put it underneath his pillow in the morning. So he went to the Prophet. And it was at this moment and not before. Only now, not before. The Prophet gave the ta'wil, the interpretation. That you must eat and drink until the light of the day is distinct from the darkness of the night. And so there are verses of the Quran which have to be interpreted. But only Allah can confirm that an interpretation is correct. So you do not use interpretations of the Quran to divide the Muslims and to create a new sect. No, you give an interpretation and you say Allah knows best because this is a test to see whether you are a people who think or you just eat your nasi biryani and go home and sleep. Which is what most of us do. We eat our nasi biryani and go home and sleep. The famous scholar of Islam of India, his name is Dr. Muhammad Iqbal outstanding scholar. He said the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam stopped thinking 500 years ago. And so when we go to the Quran to seek, to seek for what the Allah has said about modern Western civilization, it is mostly in the ayat mutashabihat you find it. But you will not find it without thinking. And part of the process of thinking is to look at the stars. Uh, I have a book at the back there called Methodology for Study of the Quran. But when I reprint that book, I want to change the title. The new title will be The Quran and the Stars methodology for study of the Quran. I'm now writing a companion volume. May Allah grant that I may finish it. The companion volume is entitled The Quran and the Moon. Methodology for recitation of the Quran. So why the stars? 
وَلَقَدْ زَيِّنَ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِهِ Allah says, we have adorned the sky with lamps. So why has he described a star as a lamp? وَمِن نَجْدِهُمْ يَهْتَدُونَ Because the stars are there not only for beauty and for entertainment, the stars are also there to guide us the direction on which a ship to travel in the sea. But you'll only be able to use the stars as lamps if you're able to read the stars, if you're able to connect the dots of history to understand in which direction history is moving. Shall I repeat that? And so it is the student who directs attention to studying the stars. Do we study the stars this way? You start from this side, Surah Al-Baqarah, and then the next star, Surah Ali Imran. And is this the way we study the stars? No. We study the stars by looking at this star and see how it is connected with that one. And then how this one is connected with that one. And so the Quran is not arranged in surahs for the purpose of study. That's not the way to study the Quran. The Quran is arranged in surahs for the purpose of recitation for Isa Karanahu Fat. Quran. But studying the Quran is differently. You have to learn to connect the ayat. How this one is connected with that one and how that one is connected with that one. And then you have to connect the Quran with the Hadith. I wish I could spend a little bit more time on methodology, but we have to move on. My initial comment on the subject of an Islamic eschatological explanation of modern Western civilization is linked with the verse of the Quran with which I began. And please don't forget it. وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءِ إِلَىٰ أَخِرِ الْآيَةِ And we sent down this book on thee, O Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, that this book might explain all things. And therefore, if there is a unique phenomenon in history, something emerges on the stage of the world unlike everything else which preceded it. And this strange new event on the stage of the world transforms the world and keeps on transforming the world and is taking the world in a mysterious direction. And this Quran does not explain it. Well, then, we are all school-wise. Or maybe it's not convenient for some. Because if you walk down this road, they might put your name on a no-fly list. <laughs> you might get a promotion. <laughs> they might say you're a terrorist. You might lose your job. <laughs> but, uh, those who are faithful to the truth are the only ones who get no. Those who are faithful to the truth are the only ones who will get no. And if we do not have no, we are blind. No is light. And this is what Allah says in the Quran. He says, 
فهو في الأخلة أعمى وأضل السبيل If you are blind here even with your PhD from MIT If you are blind here you'll be blind there as well and you'll be more misguided and so it becomes the servant of Allah to be faithful to truth so there must be an explanation in the Quran for this unique phenomenon in history an absolutely unique civilization appearing on the stage of the world an actor who emerges with a mission to establish its rule over all of mankind no one ever did that before and in the process of establishing its rule over all of mankind it gets mysteriously so unprecedented power no one ever had this kind of power before a scientific and technological revolution unfolds and keeps on unfolding and normal human thinking is enough is sorry is not enough the normal human experience with knowledge is not enough to explain this amazing scientific and technological revolution with which unprecedented power comes to the civilization and this power is used not only to deliver to them the rule over the world but more than that the capacity to transform the world again and again and again and every time it changes the world I notice because I'm not in the habit of eating my nasi biryani and going home and sleep sometimes I like to think and I notice every time it changes the world it, it gives me a faster world so I used to use a donkey and I used to use a horse and I used to use a camel and when I travel I used to enjoy the, the trees and the, the birds and I would notice the people how they were dressed and what languages they spoke and so on and so travel was an experience in the world of knowledge I was enriched in traveling but then this curious change came about and I no longer use camel not even in the desert there's no a Ford Ranger in the desert and there's a train and I could hardly see because everything is passing by the window so fast and then came the aeroplane and forget it you can't see the trees anymore and so time is moving faster and faster I used to write a letter and the ship would take six months to take it to Calcutta and then came something called the telegram and then came something called the telephone and you had to book a call to New Delhi and wait for the operator to call you two three days later and then came direct dialing direct dialing and you no longer have to use your telephone at home with a cord you now have something called a cell phone and then came something even smarter than the cell phone something called a smartphone 
you can call free of charge. So now it's no longer six months, no longer three days. It's moving faster and faster and faster and faster. And then came the internet and electronic mail. And then I was reminded because my prophet said to me, he said, be careful. In Akhirozama, time will move faster and faster. And the whole day will pass like a month. And the whole month will pass like a week. And the whole week will pass like a day. And the whole day will pass like an hour. And the whole hour will pass like the amount it takes a time to kindle a fire. So if you have the ex feeling in your heart, the time is moving faster and faster. You are on the wrong road. You better stop and go back. Look for the rock where Khidr alayhi salam is sitting. Turn around, go back, look for the rock where Khidr alayhi salam is sitting. This civilization used power for hundreds of years to oppress unprecedenting oppression. This civilization used power to exterminate the primitive way of life. Uh, you call them Orang Asli. And it took the primitive way of life and took these people and transformed them and put them into the blue jeans, Jamaat. <laughs> and now they're drinking alcohol and walking back home drunk. <laughs> the civilization took the wealth of mankind and sucked it. And then, with a mysterious indifference to moral values, to the milk of human kindness, they took even the little that the poor had and took it from the poor and left them dry. The civilization gave an economic system and a monetary system and a banking system through which they pursued an objective of enslaving all of mankind. Why is this happening? At the heart of modern Western civilization that wants to rule the world by the hook or by the crook, mostly by the crook is a mysterious alliance between part of the Christian world which has abandoned the law, which doesn't care two peanuts, which doesn't care two peanuts anymore about the law, and which goes fishing on the Sabbath day, which goes fishing on the Sabbath day. Does that ring a bell? Is the bell in Surah Al-Araf? <laughs> Does that ring a bell? Is the bell in Surah Al-Araf? Hmm? Which goes fishing on the Sabbath day. They're still fishing up to now on the Sabbath day. At the heart of this civilization is therefore a mysterious alliance between that part of the Christian world which no longer follows Jesus. I have a secret to share with you. They're following Santa Claus. And another part of the Jewish world which has, which has lost truth in Judaism and is now following a corrupted version of Judaism. And these two have formed, have reconciled and formed friendship and an alliance. As a consequence of which 
modern Western civilization, which 200 years ago was glittering like a star, and all of mankind is dazzled by it. Today, 200 years later, it says, a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. It has become a decadent civilization. A civilization experiencing moral collapse and which lives in, they call it, a secular world. It's actually a spiritual vacuum. And so it's taking mankind to the garbage bin. To the garbage bin. There's garbage now littered all over the world because of this civilization. Garbage in the political system for those who have eyes with which to see, which of course will not be those who eat the nasi biryani, go home and sleep. Garbage in the economy, garbage in the monetary system, garbage in the educational system, garbage in the male-female relationship, garbage in the bedroom as well. And our prophet said when she asked, will we be destroyed, the Arabs? She asked, will we Arabs be destroyed? And he replied, yes. When will we Arabs be destroyed? He said, either Kathul al Khabas, when garbage prevails in the world. And for those who have eyes to see, the world is now filled with garbage, which has come from this civilization. But before we end these pre preliminary comments, this civilization is taking history in a particular direction. It seems to have an obsession with the Holy Land. Nobody uses the term Holy Land anymore. They prefer another substitute term called Palestine. I search, I have not found Palestine in the Quran. I've searched, I've not found Palestine in the Hadith. <laughs> no. I have found Al-Abdul Muqaddasa in the Quran. And so I ask, why have we substituted what is in the Quran with something else? This civilization has a, a, a mysterious obsession with the Holy Land. It launched the Crusades. And if we had a few hours today, we don't have it. I would love to share with you my insights into the subject. It launched the Crusades to liberate the Holy Land. And eventually a British general in 1917, when he entered victoriously into Jerusalem, declared, today the Crusades are over. So a secular Britain, a secular Britain, was the final actor in the Holy War, the Crusades, to liberate the Holy Land. This civilization had a mysterious obsession with bringing the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. And it achieved that objective. This civilization had a mysterious objective in restoring a state of Israel in the Holy Land. And it assisted in the creation of Israel in 1948. And this civilization is now working over time to transfer power to Israel so that a Pax Britannica which emerged as the ruling state in the world and which then ceded power to Pax Americana with America ruling the world could now transfer power to a Pax Judaica.
so that Israel might rule the world. This is 20 years ago when I wrote Jerusalem in the Quran. And for 20 years that book has not been challenged. No. But this, the world of Islamic scholarship has just remained silent. They neither say Imran is right, <laughs> nor do they dare say he's wrong. A mysterious silence has met that book. This civilization, therefore, needs an explanation. Why do they want Israel to rule the world? Why are they imposing the monetary rule over mankind? They first of all banned the use of gold as money, which is there uh, in the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund. But who challenges them? It's much easier to eat your nasty biryani and go home and sleep than to challenge the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund. You might lose your job, you know. <laughs> you might even get a promotion, you know. Be careful going down that road. They ban the use of gold as money. Why? Because if gold is in the market, their burger system will not survive. That's why they ban gold. The day that gold comes into the market, their monetary system will collapse. That's why they ban gold. Even a schoolboy knows that. How many voices are there saying that? And then they brought the paper currency, a subject which we have studied, alhamdulillah, but it's not taught in the Darul Room. So our, mashallah, ulama have absolutely no knowledge of the subject. And yet they gave fatwa. And after the paper money had been used to rip off mankind, then came the petrodollar money, which allowed an even greater rip off. And then came cryptocurrencies to dislodge money from the control of governments and central banks. Any Tom, Dick or Harry can make money now. Cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin. And this is meant to pave the way for one universal currency for all of mankind. Everybody will have to use the same money. So goodbye, Salamat Jalan. Goodbye to your ru ru ringet. <laughs> Salamat Jalan to the ringet. One universal currency for all of mankind. And who will issue that money? The state of Israel, of course. And that's how Israel will rule the world. But Israel cannot continue using bogus money indefinitely. Because the reason why they want Israel to rule the world, I'll tell you the secret, but you probably already know it, is that someone who wants to impersonate the true Messiah, who is not the son of Mary, no, but he wants to impersonate the true Messiah and stand up in Jerusalem and declare, Anel Masih. I am the Messiah. Of course, he is Dajjal. He cannot do that. No Jew will accept him. No. If Israel is using bogus money, every Jewish schoolboy knows what our mufti is doing. No. But this money is bogus. So Israel has to return to gold and silver coins as money. I hope I don't live to see that day because the shame and the disgrace will be too great. What explanation is there? It is not possible that the Quran is silent on this subject. Not possible. If you cannot find the explanation in the Quran, it's because you're only looking in the Muhammad. <laughs> the explanation you should search for in the Mutashabi hat. And if you lack the capacity to interpret the Mutashabi hat, then go and search for the servants of Allah who have been blessed with that capacity. So let us now turn, and uh, we are already uh, 
half an hour one. So what does the Quran say on this subject? Nabi Muhammad is passing by. His companions are talking. What are you talking about? And they said, we're talking about Alamatu Sa'ah. And he said, the last day would not come. And he mentioned 10 signs. And you all know them. But they're not given in the chronological sequence in which they will occur. Number one, Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog. Number three, the return of Nabi Isa Islam. Number four, Dukhan or smoke. Number five, Dabbatul Ard. Number six, that the sun will rise from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine. Three earthquakes in which the earth sinks down and swallows what it swallows. One in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Arabia, not uh, Tamansri, UK. Eh? Tamansri, UK, a few Ramadans ago, the earth was sent down, and the whole house was swallowed. Were you born at that time? Okay. And then the tenth one, that a fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to the place of assembly. The Jews in Medina were questioned. How can we tell whether he is indeed a prophet of the one God? And they said, ask him three questions which only a prophet can answer. So not even International Islamic University can answer it. <laughs> Question one, ask him about the Ruh. Question number two, ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the land. And question three, ask him about the young men and the cave. Question one was actually about the Ruh al Qudus or the Holy Spirit. But the British have a special term they call it the Holy Ghost. And there was a connection between the Holy Spirit and the Messiah. And the Jews wanted to know whether he knew. Because Allah says about the Holy Spirit and the Messiah, وَإِيَدْنَاهُ بِرُوحِ Qudus, And we strengthened him with the Holy Spirit. So he could speak as a baby in the cradle. And he would speak again miraculously as an adult when he comes back. The re second reason why they question him about the Ruh is because the Christians will eventually begin to worship the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and uh, there will be controversy in the Christian world. One part of the Christian world which believes in God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. One part of the Christian world would say the Holy Spirit comes from the Father. So he is the supreme God and the others are not equal to him. Another part of the Christian world will say, no, the Holy Spirit comes from both the Father and the Son, which is ship. And when this other part of the Christian world makes this declaration, then a break will take place. And one part of the Christian world will remain in Constantinople, and the other part will go to Rome. Hmm. They wanted to know whether he knew about the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Allah. And Allah sent down an answer which confirmed that this group was correct. And that one was wrong. That the Holy Spirit comes from Allah. Then came the second question. But the first question already tells us something about modern Western civilization. That it is a it is a civilization par excellence of shirk. Of shirk. And that shirk has not affected the other part of the Christian world, which still believes that God the Father is supreme and none is equal to him. Same way the Hindus believe. You didn't know that. The Vedas say there is one supreme God. 
And the Hindus believe in all these other gods and goddesses. Oh yeah, just like the Christians. So there's not, not much difference between the Hindus and the Christians. But the Hindus say there's one supreme God, that's in the Vedas. And when you find truth anywhere in the world, your duty is to show respect for it. And when you find truth anywhere in the world, your duty is to take the people to the truth which is with them. Not to take up a bat in your hand and start to beat them and win debates. Wah, wah, wah! We won the debate! Yes, you bunch of fools with your boxing match against the Christians in your boxing match against the Hindus with a system of da'wah which is so in conflict with the Quran because Allah does not permit that boxing match. He says, Udru ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah Call people to the way of Allah with wisdom, not with boxing gloves. Oh, he won the debate. This is the biryani club. They don't know how to think. They just eat the biryani and go home and sleep. Wah, wah, we won the debate. And so, the civilization is built on shirk. And that's why they parted company from Constantinople. And then came the question about the great traveler. And the Quran refers to him as Zulkarnain. And obviously, Karn could not mean a horn. No, Karn has to mean a people, a generation, an age, an epoch, because Allah always uses the word Karn in that way in the whole Quran. So, Zulkarnain is an event that will occur twice in history. Let me repeat that. Zulkarnain is an event which will occur, recur twice in history. And the Quran proceeds to give us about the first time. And we have to do the thinking to know when the second time will come. And Zulkarnain represents power ordained by Allah. And this power rests on the foundations of faith. And he travels in the direction of the setting of the sun and comes upon a body of water which is dark and murky and we are all agreed, even in Ibn Kathir, that this is the Black Sea. Uh, Laut Hita? The Black Sea. Nobody differs with this. We have the geography of the subject now, the Black Sea. And in the region of the Black Sea, he comes across the people, Allah says, how will you deal with them? And he says, I'm going to use power to punish those who are oppressors. So when power rests on the foundations of faith, power is used to punish the oppressor. And power is used to reward those who have faith and whose conduct is righteous. Hold on to that, don't forget it. And when they return to you, you will also punish them. So there will be harmony between the world here under and the here above, world above. And then he traveled in the direction of the rising of the sun and comes across the people sitra, people living a primitive way of life. And he shows respect for the primitive way of life. He has compassion. He has kindness. He has the integrity to allow them to live their way of life unhindered. He doesn't take them and put them into the blue jeans Shabbat. This is how power is used when it rests on the foundations of faith. It respects the primitive way of life. Even if there's an ocean of oil underneath their feet, it would not deprive them of their human rights. 
It would not put economic rights before human rights. And then he traveled in the third direction, and we know it has to be a, a pass in the Caucasus Mountains. And there he comes across the people of Laikaduna whose language was totally different from all other regional languages. A unique language. The Georgian language is still like that. And they say to him, O oh, Zulkadnein, Gog and Magog are committing facade in our territory. Facade is that which corrupts, but corrupts to the extent of destroying. Uh, when a politician gets power, and then he uses that power to fill his pockets, his pockets, well, sometimes he goes to jail. I don't need to mention any names. But, <laughs> But this one, this one, is using power to corrupt and destroy. And Allah reserved the worst punishment of all for him, for Fasad. To cut off his hands and feet from opposite sides and crucify him. That's the Quran. For Fasad. And these fellows, they commit Fasad. So, can you build a barrier to protect us? Zulkarnain should have said, I don't need to build any barrier, I'll go and beat them up. Teach them. Give them the lesson of their life. They run back home. He doesn't do that. Because Gog and Magog are too powerful for him to destroy. Allah says, Hadith al-Qudsi, I have created creatures of mind so powerful that none but I can destroy them. Not Tipu Sultan, and not Saddam Hussein. I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. So he agrees to build a barrier with blocks of iron, and in that region of the world, up to this day, there's plenty of iron ore. And after he'd built the barrier, he said, give me molten copper, build a furnace, and he poured the copper over it. So it cannot rust. But there's something else about that barrier built of iron. And with copper, molten copper, that uh, if you are on the other side of the barrier, I can't talk to you by cell phone. <laughs> Do I need to say anything more? Huh? Just take a hint. I am on this side and you on that side. I can't talk to you by cell phone. Okay, leave that now for you to think. Having built the barrier, Gog and Magog could neither scale nor could they penetrate. So he he then said, "Has a rahma to Rabbi. This barrier is rahma from Allah." فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي But when that time comes of which my Lord has warned, جَعَلَهُ دَكَّةً Allah is going to bring down this barrier. Would Alexander the Greek have this knowledge in his head? Which buffoon, which buffoon would believe that Alexander has this knowledge, or that Cyrus has this knowledge. Eh? When that time comes of which my Lord has warned, he's going to bring down this barrier. And you are telling me Alexander had that knowledge? And you are telling me that Cyrus has that knowledge? Do I look, look like someone who eats biryani and go home and sleep? So we have never made any attempt to identify Zulkarnain, no. What will happen to the world when the barrier comes down? Nabi Muhammad is asleep at the home of his wife Zainab and he has a vision and he wakes up and his face is red. And he says, Go on to the Arabs, 
because of an evil which is coming now. It's close. And he raised his hands and he said, Today a hole has been made in the barrier built by Zulkarnay. And so the it is at that moment that Allah starts to bring down the barrier. And so Juj and Majuj will now be released into the world. When they are released into the world, the world will experience unprecedented power. No one can stand up to that power. Are you beginning to understand now? And that power will not be used to punish the oppressor. No. That power will now be used to oppress. That power will no longer be used to reward those who are righteous in conduct and who have faith. Rather, that power will now be used to spread a decadent way of life all over the world. So what a terrible world it will be when that barrier comes up. And that power will be used to destroy the primitive way of life. So now we leave Surah al kaf and we go quickly to Surah al anbiya of the Qur'an because our sources are the Qur'an and the Prophet Islam. And in Surah al anbiya Allah speaks about a town. As in Surah al araf He speaks about a town. But He does not identify the town because he wants us to think. So he says, وَحَرَامٌ عَلَى قَرْيَةٍ But he does not identify the town. He says, وَسْأَلْهُمْ عَنِ الْقَرْيَةَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ حَادِرَةَ الْبَحْرِ But he does not identify the town. Because he wants us to think. He destroyed the town, Surah al -Anbiya. He expelled the people of the town. He placed a ban on them. They could never return to this town to reclaim it as their own until Gog and Magog are released. And when they are released, they spread out all over the world, even Nusantara. And they take control of the world. In the world order of Gog and Magog, they corrupt everything. They corrupt the political system, they corrupt the economy, they corrupt the monetary system, they corrupt the educational system. Education belongs in this civilization to the age four when the child is introduced to the Qur'an and the child begins to learn to recite the Qur'an. That is education for us, not A for apple, B for bad, C for cat. And by the age of seven, the child is able to recite any passage of the Qur'an. And by the age of 10, the child is reciting the whole Qur'an from cover to cover once a month. And you're building the foundations for a scholar tomorrow who will be versatile. He'll have expertise in politics, he'll have expertise in economics, he'll have expertise in monetary economics, he'll have expertise in history. He now expertise in so many branches of knowledge, which is what our civilization produced, because the Quran was the foundation of knowledge, and they corrupted. So now you have to put the child in a in a tie, in a shirt and trousers, western style, to go learn to see A for apple, B for bad, C for cat. They corrupt everything. When they are released, they spread out all over the world and they take control of the world. 
in the world order of Gog and Magog. When this happens, then, says the Quran, you will see these people being brought back to this town to reclaim it as their own. Which town is it? We wrote Jerusalem in the Quran 20 years ago to argue that the, part, the town is Jerusalem. No one has challenged us in 20 years. <coughs> now, if the town is Jerusalem, because any time you interpret the Quran, you must say Allah knows best, because only Allah can confirm. If you interpret the Quran or the Hadith correctly, even if the whole world of Islamic scholarship say you are wrong, if it is the truth, it will survive. If it is the truth, if you have interpreted it correctly, you can sleep in your grave. The truth will survive. And if it is wrong, it will go down the river. <laughs> it will go down the river. The town is Jerusalem. Who are those who brought the Jews back to the Holy Land? Who are those who fought wars to liberate the Holy Land, call them the Crusades? Who are those who liberated Jerusalem for the Jews? Who are those who brought the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own? Who are those who caused the state of Israel to be restored in the Holy Land? And who are those who are now working over time so that the Pax Judaica would replace Pax Americana? Why? The answer is plain and clear. Gog and Magog are located in modern Western civilization, full stop. And so we need to tell the people who live in the West that you've been taken for a ride <laughs> because at the heart of your civilization is Gog and Magog. Hadith, a solitary Hadith. And uh, some of our scholars, excuse my language, showing disrespect for the Quran, excuse my language, by ignoring the Quran and staying with only one solitary Hadith and misunderstanding that hadith and that world of Islamic scholarship out there pathetically so pathetically so declares you're wrong Gog and Magog will only come after Nabi Isa Islam has come and he has killed the child and so everything you said today Imran Hussein is wrong Pathetically, because they've used wrong methodology. The right methodology is that you go first to the book of Allah. That is right methodology. What does the hadith say? It says that when Nabi Isa um, returns and he is killed in jail, then Allah will send. Ba'atha means to send. It doesn't say Allah will release. <laughs> it says Allah will send. But the Quran speaks of release. Futihat ya'juj wa ma'juj. And so they are mistaken. And for 20 years I've spoken to them and I've achieved zero success. They will never change. This is one part of the response. An Islamic eschatological explanation of modern Western civilization. Now we come to the second part. This him die before their very eyes on the cross. And if you and I were there, and if Dr. Mustafa Omar were there, we also would say, yes, he's dead. Because Allah says, Shubbih Allahum. Allah made it appear like that. 
And when they saw him die, part of the Israelite people were weeping because they believed in him as the Messiah. And the other part was celebrating. We've killed him, <laughs> the Messiah. So they were all expelled from the Holy Land. But this part is no longer referred to as Banu Israel. It is now referred to as Yahud, the Jews. And Allah punished them by breaking them up into bits and pieces and scattering, scattering them all over the world so they cannot ever establish a state, a holy state. The other part, Allah bless them. Allah bless them. The hadith says <laughs> us that Banu Ishaq come to a town. Janibul minha fil barba, janibul minha fil barba. And the town has three sides like a triangle. It's Constantinople. I don't have the time. I only have 15 minutes left. But one of my latest books is at the back. Constantinople in the Quran. Perhaps it's the first time someone has written on this topic. And they say, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, three times, and the town comes to them without fighting. Constantinople becomes a Christian town. And they seek to es establish a holy state here, yeah, like holy Islam. It becomes a holy Byzantine state, like holy Islam. And then the cry says, Dajjal is released amongst you. So now expect there's something going to happen here. Amongst them, the Christians in Constantinople. Yeah. And then Allah chooses to test them. They are supposed to obey the Sabbath, not work. So on the day of the Sabbath, he sent the fish. Big fish like this, jumping, but you cannot fish. And every other day of the week, no fish. What's going to happen now? This is the test. Because the Jal has corrupted them, destroyed the fish, they don't care two peanuts for the law anymore. So they went fishing. In fact, they're still fishing up to this day. Another group says, be careful, Allah will punish you. But the third group which had Basira, they said, don't worry to warn them, they passed the point of no return. I don't know how they knew that. These will never change. This is Surah Al-A'ra. Then Allah punished them. He cursed them. Who no killer than the Be apes despised. Allah will not transform a human being into a monkey. No. Nor is the way of life of the monkeys where they are naked and they, their bedroom life is in public. That's not disgraceful for them. That's their fitra. So what Allah is saying is that these people are now cursed by Allah to eventually have a preference for public nakedness and a preference for sexual relations in public like monkeys. And so modern Western civilization is monkey town. That's it. Cursed by Allah to live like monkeys. Monkey town. And so you have two worlds of Christianity now. The modern West empowered by a scientific and technological revolution and monstrously obsessed with ruling the world. And that part of the Christian world which refuses to bow down and bend their knee before them. That part of the Christian world is led by Russia now. The Soviet Union deceived me as Mao Zedong deceived me. I did not connect the dots of history. Now. I now realize that Allah can use his alim to pursue an advanced submission. And Allah used the Soviet Union and he used Mao Zedong and Chinese communism to advance his mission. 
and they brought, they both took the, the countries and transformed them from agricultural economies and a serfdom into modern country, modern states that are scientifically and technologically advanced to such an extent and with an economic power and strength that they could stand up to Gaurav Maharaj. If that had not occurred, the United States would already have intervened in Venezuela. They have tried every single trick they could try to overthrow the regime in Venezuela and they have failed. And they dare not intervene militarily because the power of the alliance between Russia and China is too powerful for them. I met with a deputy minister of the government of Malaysia, I won't mention what's his name, but he was a political scientist. And when I said to him the most important development which have occurred in modern history since the emergence of modern Western civilization is the alliance of Russia and China today. And they are right the alliance between the Orthodox Christian world and the world of Islam tomorrow. He was astonished because modern political science knows nothing about this. There's a victory coming for Rome. And when that victory comes, goodbye to modern Western civilization. Allah says, Go liberty Rome. Fi adnal wa hum min ba'di ghalabihim sayaglibun. Rome was defeated, but Rome will soon be victorious in just a few, few years' time. Rome, of course, is Constantinople. Tell the schoolboy that for me. But then Allah goes on to say, Min wa min bad. Rome will be victorious twice. Min wa min bad before and after. So there must be something in between, a defining moment in the history of Rome. The first victory was before and the second will be after. And our opinion in Allah knows that it's 1054 when the great schism took place. And once I say, no, the Holy Spirit comes from the Father. And the other side said, the Holy Spirit come from the Father and the Son. Goodbye, we're going to Rome. And they created Western Christianity. That was 1054. And the Crusades were launched in 1090. So when will the second victory come? And Allah says, وَيَوْمَيْدٍ يَفْرَهُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ when the first victory took place in the lifetime of the Prophet we celebrated. And when the second victory comes, we will also celebrate. Nabi Isa is there. They're going to crucify him. He doesn't know what's going to happen. Then Allah spoke to him. And that conversation is recorded in the Quran. And Allah says to him, Ya Isa, in Nimut of a fig, O Jesus, I'm going to take your soul. I'm going to take your soul. If Allah takes the soul, he can only do two things, not three. He can either keep the soul or return it. That's all, nothing else. If he kept the soul, he's dead. But Allah says, no, they did not kill him. They did not crucify him. So the obvious implication is he took the soul and returned it. In the fika, go and I'm going to raise you unto myself. So where is he? He's not in Jannah. He's with Allah. Wa mutahhiru min al-ladina kafaru. They said she committed sina. They said he's a bastard. I am going to cleanse you of this to such an extent 
that the time will come, no one will dare to open their mouth and say such a thing. Alhamdulillah, today, they dare not open their mouth to say such a thing. This is fulfilled. Now listen to the rest. وَجَعِلُوا الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ فَوْكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ And I'm going to raise those who follow you, Jesus, not those who follow Santa Claus. Raise you to that position of dominance over this group which is committing kufr against you and their Christian allies, which is NATO. Which is NATO. I'm going to raise you to that position of dominance over them and when I do that, you will remain in that position of dominance until the end of the world. Did you know this is in the Quran? So where did this nonsense come from? That Muslims want to rule the world. <laughs> where did this nonsense come from? That we're going to rule the world. Huh? Where did this nonsense come from? The Quran says something else. When will Allah establish that dominance for that part of the world who follows Jesus? If we, read, if we return, I only have a few minutes left now. If we go to Surah Rahman of the Quran, we have to ask the question. When Allah is so economical in the use of language in the Quran, He never wastes words. Why would He repeat one ayah of the Quran? <coughs> 31 times. For be a year, Why? He repeats it 31 times. Could this be by accident? No. This is 31 times he's knocking, knocking, knocking at our minds, telling us that there is very, very, very important information in this surah. And it pertains to the great war which is coming. <laughs> and in that war, Allah will intervene. I don't have the time, I've run out of time, but I have a book at the back called The Quran, The Great War and the West. That the West is going to lose this war. <coughs> NATO is going to lose this war. And praise is due to Allah. And in the world which comes after that nuclear war, war, power, nuclear war, there is many, there is protection for us from all the radiation that will come from nuclear war. And that protection is in the recitation of the Quran. جَعَلْنَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ حِجَابًا مَسْتُورًا Beautiful. When you recite the Qur'an as it ought to be recited, that way only, we place a hijab protecting you from them, protecting you from all that radiation, protecting you from harm, and that hijab will be mastur. It will cover you. An invisible hijab. This is the end of my talk. I wish I had another half an hour, but I don't. And we pray that uh, Allah may bless those who now return to the Quran. And to Nabi Muhammad, that this Quran might explain modern Western civilization, its origin, its role in history, and the end which is now coming to it. Rabbana, taqabbal minna inna ka anta samil alim, wa alina ya mawlana. إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الرحيم أمين